If you've got a Bible, please open it to Genesis chapter 11. That's where we're going to be tonight. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're, we're working through a series that we're giving a week off. And uh, I do apologize, you know, um, ordinarily we'd spend a really good chunk of time as pastors in our week preparing to speak. And uh, this morning I got about 20 minutes. And uh, so this is, this is a talk from like 10 years ago. And I was relying on the fact that me 10 years ago had some good things to say. <laughs> And it's very touch and go that me present has good things to say, let alone me 10 years ago. So you're getting some hodgepodge stuff, but hopefully encouraging hodgepodge stuff. And uh, past James was, I don't know, smarter than I think he was. Uh, I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 11, just going to read verses 1 through 9. Uh, Let me read. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, And they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. There's our passage for tonight. How about I pray? Ask God for his help. We'll try and make sense of it. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that what we do tonight will be precisely what many of us need to hear. And I pray that we might be surprised by how such a strange ancient story might speak to the realities of our weeks and our months and our years and our lives. I pray you'd give us the capacity to see ourselves a little more clearly. I pray that you'd help us to see where this passage fits in the Bible and what it actually says to us about life in this world and who we should live for. Uh, And I pray that in this passage, we'd see reminders of your grace and your kindness towards us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I have memories of being in so many different places, whether it be school, university, workplaces, where people would say to me or us as a group, you need to reflect. And I would just, my natural instinct in that moment was to go like, oh, gosh, does anyone else feel that way when someone tells you to reflect? Like, you need to be more self-reflective. You need to think about what's going on for you a little bit more. And you're like, can't we just get on with it? (laughs) I think men in particular don't like to reflect. We'd rather do anything but most of the time. But, and I realise the downside is what I want to ask you to do tonight is to reflect a little bit. To, to be a little more considerate about what's going on for you in certain moments in your life. So I want you to imagine, like, what's going on for you when you're late for something and stuck in traffic and you're angry? What's going on in your heart in that moment? What's going on for you when you feel like you have to wait too long at the doctor's or at the supermarket? There's, like, a million people and you're queued up and you, you just can't fathom Like, why wouldn't the doctor structure their day better? Why wouldn't Woolies put more checkout people on? What's going on for you when the music at church or in the waiting room at the doctor's isn't to your liking? What's going on for you when the internet stops working or is slow? You know that moment when you feel in your bones like this is not right, this is not okay? What's going on for you when a colleague 
or someone at school or university makes a veiled comment that's clearly in your direction and not that veiled? In your response to that person, what's going on in your heart? What's going on for you when your family members don't do for you what you hoped they had done, that you wanted them to do? Maybe your parents don't do what you'd hoped. Maybe your kids don't do what you'd hoped. Maybe you hoped that your siblings would do something for you when they didn't. What's going on in your heart when your family members make choices that mean more work for you in caring for them? So it's worth reflecting on those things. We don't normally reflect. We just get cranky that the internet is slow. And then when it starts working again, we feel that all is good in the world. And we don't actually investigate what's going on in our heart in those moments. See, what I want to suggest tonight is so many of our reactions betray a reality of our hearts that we want the world to exist for us. That we want the world to revolve around us. That we actually really care most about our kingdom. Um, when I was a kid, I have many secret musical shames, but when I was a kid, I was into John Farnham. Now, I mentioned this actually at the Life Course recently, and Ash Christie said to me, who's John Farnham? And I felt so old. Oh, my goodness. Later, I played a song for her, so she would know. She's like, oh, yeah, I've heard that song before. It made me feel a lot better. But I remember as a kid having like this dream that one day he'd show up and say, James, come and join the band. Let's go. And, and I think in me as a young kid, there was this desire for, for fame and acclaim and praise. Now, I have no desire in my life to be famous. None. I was watching a documentary this week and there was a, an English football player in it and he was saying that when he went to the supermarket and had a hoodie on and a face mask, they still recognised him. And eight people who worked in the supermarket were waiting outside for photos and autographs. And he's like, I can't go anywhere anymore. I, so like fame, I am not interested in that. But let me say, there's still plenty going on in my life and heart where I want the acclaim of people. There's still something in me that wants to prove myself, to live for the sake of my name, to lift myself up, to seek my glory. That comes really naturally. And my hunch is I'm not the only one in the room who thinks like that. I see pride at work in my life all the time. You might think, oh, I'm not that proud. I'm very humble. Well, you just lost it because you said how humble you are. I reckon most of us aren't walking around thinking about how great we are, but often that plays out in moments when we look down on others. When we go to the shops and we see someone and we judge them, it could be because of how they dress, it could be because of how they speak, it could be because of all sorts of things. Like I was on the touchline at my kids' soccer game yesterday and I saw a parent with a dog and he punched it. And I immediately thought, oh my goodness. Now, I don't think that was the right thing to do, but it's so easy to put yourself above other people and look down on other people to think too highly of ourselves. And so tonight I wanna to ask you, as frustrating as it may be to reflect and think in terms of your life, who is it all about? Who are you living for? For whose name and sake are you living? And to answer that question, we're going to have a look at Genesis chapter 11. It is a weird passage. I really love the weird passages of the Bible. I think mostly I, what I love about the weird passages of the Bible is that they're often surprising. We read them and go, what the heck are you going to do with that? And as you dig into them, you discover, oh, wow, the Bible is better than I thought. So we're going to start with some context because this... Uh, this passage about a construction site in the ancient world doesn't pop out of nowhere. So we're going to do some context. Then we're going to have a think about how this passage would have been read and understood by Israel, who first read it, so that we don't make the mistake of making it say things that it was never intended to say. And then we're going to step back and think about what it says to us. 
Let's start with some context. Uh, One of the reasons I wanted to do this passage is because we've done Genesis 1 to 3 over the last two weeks. If you weren't here, here's a very short summary of the first sort of 10 chapters or so of the Bible. Genesis 1, God creates the world. It's good. He makes us humanity, male and female, in his image to rule over creation. Uh, We saw last week, Genesis 3, that everything goes bad. And that Genesis 3, in some ways, was Israel's history in miniature. So God places his people in his place. He gives them his commands of how they should live in his place where he dwells with them. He gives them his laws. There's temptation in their midst. They rebel against God and he banishes them. It's the history of Israel in miniature. Um, And when he banishes them, we see in chapter 3 that the entrance to the Garden of Eden is on the east and that God's people are sent out eastward, away from the Garden. Now, in Genesis 4, you hope that a rescuer is going to come, but instead the rescuer kills his brother. It's pretty brutal. In Genesis 6, you get to... And so you've got to notice that the trajectory is blessing right at the start. God blesses people. And then everything just goes worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. In Genesis 6, it says that the inclinations and thoughts of man's heart was only evil all of the time. That's quite damning, isn't it? And so there's the flood. Noah and his family survive. If you've got a Bible there, have a look at Genesis chapter 10. It's one of those passages that we readily skip over. It's often called the Table of Nations. It's just a list of names of Noah's sons and their descendants. Uh, I mentioned last week that in Genesis, that phrase, these are the generations, is a bit of a structural marker, and there are major ones and minor ones. This is more a minor one. But we've got a list of the descendants of Noah, And there's a few things worth noticing in this passage that will help us make sense of Babel. Firstly, it gives some sense to ancient nations in the world, but I want you to note something about their languages. If you look at verse 5, we've just heard about the sons of Japheth. Verse 5, it says, From these the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. Do you notice that? So it's telling us, that there is a dispersion of people throughout the world who have separate languages. And then when we get to Genesis 11, it says, now everyone had the one language. It's just worth noting it's a little bit out of order. Now, there are a few other things that are important to notice in this, in this chapter 10 that helps us to see number uh, chapter 11. So have a look at verse 8. Cush fathered Nimrod. What a name. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. So if you see someone who's next level at fighting, you can call them a Nimrod, I suppose. Um, But notice verse 10. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which was in the land of Shinar. So Nimrod is around for the Genesis 11 passage, but he's not named. That's significant. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, if you flick over, well, for me, it's over the page. It might not be for you. To verse 25, we meet a guy named Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, which means division, for in his days the earth was divided. Most scholars take that as a reference to the Tower of Babel. So in the days of Peleg was the point where language became divided on the earth. What's also interesting is that we've got lists of names before the Babel account and after the Babel account, and Noah's sons, it goes Japheth, then Ham, that's a good name, especially for someone who's, you know, an ancestor of Jewish people, that's kind of funny. Um, And then you end up with Shem, a list of his descendants, and then after Babel, you get a list again of Shem's descendants, and you're thinking, didn't we get it the first time? Why do we need to double up on Shem's descendants? Shem, interestingly, means name. So we get the descendants of name before the Babel account and the descendants of name after the Babel account, and what's going on in Babel? They're trying to make a name for themselves, and none of them are named. And then we get to Abram in Genesis 12, and God says, I will make your name great. His is a name that's going to last forever. Now, another thing that's helpful to know in the background is that there's an ancient Assyrian creation account called the Enuma Elish. 
and it includes some similar stories that we find in the first chapters of, of Genesis in the Bible. It even includes a story about some people who baked bricks and built something. Uh, the idea was that they were elevating themselves to heaven, making a tower for the gods. It's sort of connected to Babylonian religion, and it's all about a Babylonian god named Marduk. And this city, Babel, that they built, which is really the precursor to Babylon, which runs a thread that runs through the Bible, in Akkadian, in the language, it means gateway of the gods. So think like a tourism kind of promotional thing where you're, kind of, you're trying to show off your city. Babel, it's where heaven and earth meet. The idea that if you wanted to go to the place where heaven and earth come together, you go to Babel because their tower is the highest and the best. And so there's pagan belief in the background that if you want to meet God, you need to go to the special place and it needs to be high up in the sky because the gods dwell in the sky. Now, you might be going, oh, hang on, you said there's another ancient account, so does that mean that the Bible copied it? Um, does that mean that the Bible's not reliable in telling us what happened? Well, actually, what I want to suggest is this helps explain what's going on in this passage, because this passage, I think it is trying to tell us history. It does give us some origins on how different languages came to be on earth. I don't think it's its primary concern. I don't think this story was told to Israel just so that they would know why people speak different languages, like a fable. Rather, it's highly stylized. It's satirical. In the Hebrew, there's alliteration and play on words throughout. It's out of chronological order. Intentionally, the author's mixing it. So we've got names about the descendants of name and then some people who are unnamed and then names and then Abram. That's a brilliant piece of literature that's trying to do more than just tell us about how the languages came about. So there's some background. Let, let's jump into the passage and try and work through the, the text and, and make sense of it. So if you've got a Bible, grab it with me. Verse 1, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now there's something symbolic about heading eastward. In the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple had their entrance on, entrance on the east just like the Garden of Eden. It doesn't mean that to head west is towards God and to head east is to, you know, like to go away from God. You don't need to worry or always drive westward. I mean, this is very tricky to do. But there is something symbolic about moving away from the presence of God. At the same time, if you look back at chapter 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons, said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Again, verse 7, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply. Like there's this picture after the flood where God expects that Noah's descendants to spread out and disperse on the earth. And yet these descendants of Noah are settling in one place and trying to get everyone to come to them. Have a look at their plan, verse 3. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. That doesn't mean that they overcook the bricks. I, I assume that's a good way of cooking bricks, burning them thoroughly. It's similar to the enumeralish account, but I also think it's similar to Genesis 1, where God says, come, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness. There's some kind of claim to divinity going on here. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. There, they're trying to build what most scholars think that they were building like a, a stepped pyramid, if you can imagine that's often called a ziggurat, and they might have a place at the top where sacrifices were made that was the holy spot, the idea that the gods come down and we go up and meet in the middle. There'd also be a temple at the bottom for priests. They thought this was a stairway to heaven. And notice their motivation, verse 4. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So they're actually coming together to unite against God's command to disperse and fill the earth. 
And in some ways, this is a, a brilliant picture of pagan worship, of how people in the ancient world worship God. They connected with God by going up and connecting on their own terms. It's like they're trying to get back to the garden without God. And this fear of dispersion seems to be the, the point that they're disobeying what God's intent is. Now, have a look at verse 5, because this is where the satire comes in. You, you're supposed to sort of snigger, I think, as you read these verses, rather than think that God is limited. So they've said, come, let us do this. And then verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of man had built. They thought they were building a tower reaching to the heavens, and yet God had to come down to have a look at it. Now, don't do the thing where you go, but God can see everything. He didn't need to come down. Yeah, 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 I know. But the writer's making a point. The writer's saying their attempt was so tiny, so limited, that God had to come down and see it. And notice what he calls them. They're called the children of man. It's like God's going, oh, bless their little socks. They had a go. They tried to build a tower. It's, it's like a three-year-old building a Lego tower and going, look how huge this is. And you go, yeah, good one. It's like God is mocking their attempt to get to him. And in verse 6, God says, Behold, they're one people, they have one language. This is only the beginning of what they do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. God's not afraid of them. He's not afraid of them. He, he doesn't come down to bless, but rather to divide. Now, isn't it interesting? Because normally we would say unity is a good thing. Like they're all together in this great purpose. Human unity is ordinarily a good thing, but they're united in evil purpose. Unity is not always good. We would not say the systematic approach of Nazi Germany to eliminate Jewish people was good unity. We'd say it's unity towards evil. God's not scared. He's not going, oh gosh, I made these people and they're really capable, so I better stop them from doing some stuff or things might go really bad. No, no. God is acting to restrain evil. He's acting to stop these people from forming together and live lives that are in complete opposition to his will. So he's not scared. And then God uses the same language that they do. They said, come, let us do this, as if they could. And God says, come, let us go down there and confuse their language so they may not understand one another. And so the language is confused, the people are dispersed, the building stops. And here's where some more satire comes in. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. In Akkadian, Babel meant gateway of the gods, heaven on earth. In Hebrew, it means confused. It's like God is saying to these people, you thought you were trying to build heaven on earth. You thought you could make your way to the heavens. You're just a confused little bunch of kids. Did they make a tower to the heavens? No. Did they make a name for themselves? No. No one's named. Did you notice that? No one's named. In fact, the only name used in the passage is Babel, and it's actually used satirically to mock their attempt to get to heaven. Do they stay in Babel? No. So as, as we reflect on this passage, what I want to encourage us to, to think through for a little bit is, what do I do when I'm faced with a weird story of the Bible and how do I apply it? So a, a bad way to apply the Bible is to say we shouldn't build anything. A bad way to apply it here is go, well, don't bake your bricks thoroughly. That would be poor brick making. Um, don't come to me for advice on anything to do with building. That would be a real mistake. What's really helpful to do is to think, who is this written for? So the first five books of the Bible, most scholars think were put together by Moses, and they're written for the Israelites as they've left Egypt and are entering the promised land. And so it's worth thinking, what would this story do in the minds and hearts of an Israelite. It's not really going to be where parents tell their kids this story so kids go, ah, so that's why the Canaanites speak different languages to us. It's not really that kind of origin story. 
There's something in here that's meant to be, I think, a motivation for Israel to obey God's word. He said to spread out. They didn't. Look what happened. Obey the covenant. There's something here about living for the sake of God's name rather than Israel living for the sake of their name. You know, in Deuteronomy, God says to Israel, I didn't choose you because you guys were the best. I didn't choose you because you were the prettiest or the strongest. I chose you because you were the weakest and the smallest. And I wanted to display my glory in rescuing you. It's why God saved Israel to display his glory. I think there's also something here where God is trying to say to his people, you need to come to me on my terms. So they're going to go into the promised land. They're going to set up the tabernacle. They're going to build a temple. And God is saying to his people, don't come to me on the basis of what you reckon is a good way to approach me. Come to me on how I've revealed myself. Come to the tabernacle. Go through the priestly system. You know, one of the perpetual mistakes of Israel is that they made offerings at the high places. Ever read that in the Old Testament? Why do they go to high places? Because there's this pagan belief that if you want to get to the gods, you go up. You get really high. That's where the gods come down. And God says, no, 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 I dwell in your presence by my grace. Come to me on my terms. And I think there's a warning here for Israel too, right? Like if they disobey, if they worship idols, if they engage in worship like the pagans did around them, God is actually saying to them, I'm going to mock your false worship. So there's a story in, uh, in the Old Testament where the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, that's the, the box that holds the law. And they put it in the temple of their god, Dagon. And it was meant to be like, we beat the Israelite god. And Dagon is celebrating. And the next day they come into the temple, because they had an image of Dagon in the temple, and they've put the Ark of the Covenant in there. And they find Dagon on the ground, bowing down to the Ark of the Covenant. And they go, oh better fix that. So they pop Dagon back up and then the next day they come back in and you know what they find? Dagon's on the ground again except this time his head's been cut off. (laughs) It's a picture that God will not tolerate rivals. There's also a warning here to Israel. They were meant to exist for the fame of God, not for themselves. In fact, they were supposed to glory in their weakness. They were supposed to say, oh, we didn't save ourselves. We were on the banks of the Red Sea, literally pooing our pants, and God saved us. We were slaves, weak, powerless, and God saved us. They were meant to be the people that pointed the rest of the world to the greatness of God. And God, I think again, is warning his people Israel, if you're not faithful to my covenant, I will scatter you through the world. This is a warning of exile to come. And one of the great ironies of this passage is who are the people that come and destroy Jerusalem and send them into exile? It's the people of Babylon. And so throughout the Bible, Babel or Babylon becomes a symbol of those who are against God's purposes. They're at the start of the Bible here. They show up in the middle of the Bible when they invade and take Israel uh, into exile. And if you get to the end of the Bible, right at the end of Revelation, before God destroys sin and death once and for all, he destroys Babylon in the book of Revelation. It's like the Bible is saying, either you belong to Jerusalem, God's people, or Babylon, those who stand opposed. Here's the challenge. You and I, we're not Israelites under the old covenant. We weren't slaves in Egypt who were rescued. But I want to suggest that there are timeless truths here. And a good way to read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament and stories like this, is to think, okay, what are the theological principles that God is giving to his people to live by and do they still apply? So he's not telling us to not build houses. That's that's not a fair application of the text. But I think one question that's worth us considering is for whose name should we live for? For whose name do we live for? Now, the obvious answer in the passage is, well, yeah, God, okay, yeah. 
It's like we're back in Sunday school where the answer is Jesus, God, Bible. And if you just say those three, one of them's right. Like, that's kind of true of this passage. A life, if you're a Christian, it means that you've been bought by Jesus. Then you should seek to make God look spectacular. The truth is, so often we live for the sake of our own name, our own fame. We do it in small ways when we tell stories and we're the hero of the stories that we tell. We live for the sake of our name when we don't listen to other people. Like in their moment, we're deciding they're not important. We do it when we refuse to admit we're wrong. Like there's a saying in one of my family members, uh, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> See, it's all our glory, our pride. It happens in other ways, in the workplace or at school when we work for the praise of others, when we're concerned for our success so that people will think we're great, or when we're lazy because we think that other people should work harder than us. And you just have to ask the question, why is that? Why would we think like that? Or our money, we use it all for us, for the sake of our name. We use money to build our kingdom. Or in relationship, where we treat others harshly on one end of the scale because they should do what we say. Or on the other end, where we do anything we can to make people pleased with us and happy with us because we want our name to look good. We care about our reputation. It happens with parents. Like I've seen myself do this when my response to my kids is to discipline them, not for their good, but because of how they make me look. Like I'm more concerned with their behaviour, don't make me look bad, than I am with, hey, you should live a life that honours the Lord. Or I try and tell myself it's both. You know, it's both. It's not just that I get embarrassed by your behaviour, it's also I want you to live in light of the Lord. But really, what's the thing, where's the heat in my heart? It's my reputation. Like, I want to ask you to reflect, what do you daydream about? Do you daydream about your comfort, about your purposes, about you getting what you want? Is it your fame? Or Christian, do you daydream about the fame of Jesus? Do you daydream about people coming to know him? See, I think in those moments we actually discover what we love. And if I'm honest, most of the time I'm daydreaming about my kingdom and not his. And so I think this passage in Babel actually calls us to repent of that. To think, what does it look like to live for his name? Jesus has so much to say about that. In the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples to count the cost of following him, to take up their cross. And he doesn't mean jewelry. He literally means execution stick. It's lay your life down. Be ready to die for him. In Philippians, Paul says that God has granted to us the privilege of suffering. Jesus says, if you want to keep your life, you've got to lose it. It's like he says, you need to allow your money, your reputation, even, and I realise this is challenging, even the dreams you have for your life, allow them to die at the foot of his cross and live for the sake of his name and for his kingdom rather than yours. Living for the name of Jesus has to mean obedience, right? You can't say my life is all about Jesus, but I'm going to pick and choose what I'm going to obey in terms of what he says. That, that's not how it works. And so I wonder, where is your life not lining up? This is a call to confess. Uh, think about service. We serve what we love. Often we serve ourselves and not others. But the picture of Christian service is putting yourself last, outdoing others in honour, serving for the glory and fame of Jesus, not so that I, I, we, you look great. At the core, it's the opposite of pride. It's humility. It's forgetting myself and looking to make Jesus look good. It's a life that says it's all about him. It's not about me. It's not about my fame and honour and my reputation. It's not about how good people think I am. It's about how good people think Jesus is. And so I want to ask you to reflect, are you living to make your name great? Is that how you're living? 
Or are you living to make his name great? If you're a Christian, that's the Christian life. Living for the sake of Jesus' name. And Babel says, be warned, he won't tolerate rivals. He'll cut off the head of Dagon. And many of us have had the experience when we've lived for something other than Jesus only to find that frustrating. And I want to encourage you, that's the mercy of God. When the thing that we think will satisfy our souls doesn't, that is the gentle mercy of God in our lives. And the sad irony of of Babel is that living for the sake of your own name leads to death, not to life. But living for him, dying to self, leads to life. So for whose name are you living? Now lastly, and very briefly, living for the sake of Jesus' name means connecting on his terms. No towel will do it. I know none of you are thinking, all right, I'm going to head home, build a ziggurat in my backyard, and uh, I'm going to get up to God and say good day. Like, none of us are thinking about doing that. But isn't it true that often we do things in order to make God love us or like us? Isn't that what's going on in our hearts? We build metaphorical babels. We think, if I just read my Bible, if I just do this, if I just do A, B, C, D, then God will love me. But Babel tells us you can't make up your own religion and connect with God on your terms. It has to be on his. A few chapters later in Genesis, a bloke named Jacob will have a vision of a ladder with angels ascending and descending. It's where we get the phrase stairway to heaven. Uh, It's not just a Led Zeppelin song. But one of the cool links between Genesis 11 and the gospel is that in Genesis 11, God comes down to disperse. But in Jesus, God comes down to gather. In Genesis, God comes down to confuse. And in Jesus, God comes down to make clear. Jesus brings life by dying. Our world says, if you want to be right with God, be really good. That's what most average Aussies think who believe that there is a God out there. Be really good and God will go, that's okay. That's just connecting to God on our own terms. That's climbing our own Tower of Babel. In Acts 4, it says there's no other name by which a person is saved other than Jesus. He left the glory of heaven to come down and rescue us and save us from ourselves so that we might be in the presence of God. Every other world religion says work hard and climb the ladder. Christianity is far more bleak and far more beautiful. It says you can't climb the ladder even if you tried. God had to come down in order to pull us up. And so if you're not a Christian here tonight, I'm so glad you're here. I hope you hear very clearly. The only way to get to God is through the grace of God, through what Jesus has done on your behalf. The Bible says the response to Jesus is to repent of sin and trust in him, to put all your hope in Jesus for your salvation. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, I hope you're reminded that we have access through Jesus, that none of us should spend our days going, hey, check out that tower I built. But rather our boast is in Christ, in his death and resurrection. You know, the amazing thing about God is that he seeks to display his glory in the world and make his name great, which makes him sound like an egomaniac. But the way that he does it is by humbling himself. The way he displays his glory is by offering grace, undeserved kindness. And so, Christians, my prayer is that we will marvel at the grace of Jesus, because to the degree we see that he came down, to that degree we'll be able to stop living for the sake of our names and be eager and delighted to live for the sake of his. I want to pray. Musos, if you want to come up, we're going to sing a final song. Let me pray. Lord God, thanks for your grace to us in Jesus. Thanks for this weird story about some people who built a tower. I pray that you'll challenge us and encourage us to live for the sake of the name of Jesus. I pray that you'd help us to put aside our own kingdoms and live for your sake, knowing that Jesus came down not to disperse us, but to make us a new people. He didn't come down to kick us out. He came down to be kicked out for us on the cross, that our sin might be paid in full and we might be reconciled to you. 
Help us to marvel afresh at your grace. And help us to actually do the work of reflecting of why we do what we do, that we might be people who live for your kingdom and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. Mm-hmm.